This is a presentation I put together on Daniel's 70 weeks for eschatology class at Urshan Graduate School of Theology. I'm going to be reading from Daniel chapter 9 from the New King James Version, and then I also have the passages outlined here on the chart. Daniel 9.24 says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of a prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. At the beginning of chapter 9, Daniel prayed about the prophecy of Jeremiah and the 70 years of captivity, and he understood based upon when that prophecy was made that the 70 years of captivity were coming to an end. So when the angel Gabriel announced to Daniel that 70 weeks are determined, we understand that Gabriel is talking about prophetic weeks of years, not literal weeks of days, seeing as how the new period of 70 weeks is dependent upon Jeremiah's 70 years. In Hebrew, the word weeks means period of seven and can refer to any period of seven, seven days, seven weeks, seven years. What the exact period of seven is must be determined by the context of the scriptures. Since Daniel had been praying conserving the 70 years of captivity, it seems natural to understand these 70 weeks as weeks of years, not days. Even Brown Driver Brig Lexicon in defining the word weeks in Daniel 9 states that it is seven of years. In other words, Daniel's 70 weeks is a prophecy of 70 years times seven, which equals 490 years. So Daniel's 70 weeks is a prophecy of 490 years. This period of 490 years, referred to as Daniel's 70 weeks, begins at the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And from that commandment to the Messiah is seven weeks and 62 weeks, which equals 69 weeks of years, or 69 years times seven. That's 483 years from the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. After the period of 62 weeks, which we understand the first seven weeks have already taken place. So that's seven weeks plus 62 weeks. So another way for us to say this is after 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Here is just a linear chart to visualize the 70 weeks of Daniel. We have the three divisions of seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then the final one week, which is the 70th week. So the seven weeks and 62 weeks from the decree to the Messiah is 483 years. Add to that the final one prophetic week of seven years, and you will have a prophecy of 490 years. So when did Daniel's 70 weeks begin? Daniel 9.25 says, from the command to rebuild Jerusalem, to Messiah the Prince is seven weeks and 62 weeks. That is 69 prophetic weeks. So the starting point of this period of 490 years is from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Scholars generally look at four different commands 
as the starting point of Daniel's 70 weeks. The decree of Cyrus mentioned in Ezra 1, 1 through 4. The decree of Darius found in Ezra 5, 3 through 7. The decree of Artaxerxes recorded in Ezra 7, 11 through 26. Or the decree of Nehemiah in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. Of the four choices, the two most prominent views are those of Cyrus and Artaxerxes. Isaiah specifically mentions Cyrus in Isaiah 44, 28 as being the one to give the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And Ezra 1 and 1 also specifically mentions Cyrus's decree as being the fulfillment of the word of the Lord from the mouth of Jeremiah, which takes us to Jeremiah 29, 10, the 70 years of captivity, which is the prophecy Daniel was praying about when Gabriel revealed to him the 70 weeks. However, Scholars who accept the decree of Cyrus typically reject the traditional date of this decree of 536 BC as being too early, and they list a date of 457 BC, which is also the traditional date of the decree of Artaxerxes. Actually, Ezra 614 regards all three decrees, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, as one commandment. Think of our oneness Pentecostal exegete of Matthew 28, 19, and then apply it to Ezra 6, 14. The command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. Now, I've read some commentaries that choose Nehemiah's decree in 444 BC, but Nehemiah's decree was actually just to assist in accomplishing the work that had already been commanded and was just hindered. So Nehemiah's decree wasn't so much a, a command to restore and re rebuild Jerusalem, but to continue the work to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Also, if you start at Nehemiah's decree in 444 BC and you move forward 483 years, it brings you to about 39 AD, which doesn't bring you to Messiah. It actually overshoots the Messiah by several years. Those commentaries that choose Nehemiah's decree really have to work some chronological gymnastics and some common core math to get 483 years to bring you to Messiah, which makes me question why they would go to such great lengths to start with Nehemiah anyway. I know what they do. They start off with prophetic years, then they move to Julian years and Gregorian years, but what they've done is they've changed the currency of the year three different times. And this would be like if you went to your employer and your employer said, I'm going to pay you $28 an hour. And then when you get your paycheck, you are only being paid $20 an hour. And then you go to your employer and you say, hey, we have a contractual agreement that I'm going to be paid $28 an hour, but my paycheck is reflecting that it's short by $8 an hour. You're only paying me $20 an hour. And then the employer says, well, what we did is we started off with one currency, then we moved to a second currency, and then by the time we got to the third currency, I know that it looks like you're being paid $20 an hour, but in reality, it's, it's $28 an hour. That's not going to fly. When you change the currency three times, it still doesn't equal 483 years from Nehemiah in 444 BC to Messiah. 483 years, counting from 444 BC, overshoots the Messiah by several years. Now, given the way that Ezra lumps Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes as one commandment, notice again that it's the word command is singular because Cyrus really decreed to rebuild the temple then Darius built upon that, and Artaxerxes carried it even further to include the rebuilding of the city and the commonwealth. Then 457 BC appears to me to be the logical choice of the start of Daniel's 70 weeks. And most Bible scholars who take Daniel's 70 weeks as literal start with this date. When we begin Daniel's 70 weeks in 457 BC, 
And then from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah, the prince is seven weeks and 62 weeks. That totals together is the 69 weeks of years or 69 times seven, which equals 483 years. But notice that the time period from the command to rebuild to Messiah is broken into two sections, seven weeks and 62 weeks. If you begin Daniel's 70 weeks at 457 BC, moving forward seven weeks or 49 years will bring you to 408 BC, which historically is the very year the work to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was completed. Isn't that amazing? So from going from 457 BC, 483 years, brings us to 26 AD. If we understand that Jesus Christ was born around 4 BC, then AD 26 places us in the 30th year of Christ's life, which according to Luke 2.23 is the time of Jesus' baptism and the beginning of his ministry, probably in the late summer of AD 26. So this is really when the Messiah publicly steps out on the scene and makes himself known as John the Baptist proclaims, there is one coming after me who is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then John publicly announces Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God. So the first seven weeks ends with the completion of rebuilding Jerusalem and the additional 62 weeks brings us to Christ's baptism and the beginning of his public ministry. And notice that the seven weeks and the 62 weeks run consecutively without any sort of breaks or gaps. Now I have changed the chart just a bit, but not contextually. I've just kind of enlarged the final week, which is Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 9.26 says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. In the Septuagint, there is a double use of the definite article. It's literally after the period of the 62. So after this period of 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Again, we understand the first seven weeks have already come to pass before the period of 62 weeks. Thus, we understand the prophecy to mean that after 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Well, what comes after 69? Any elementary school student who can count to 100 can answer this question and will tell you that the obvious answer is 70. If I were to tell my children, 70 weeks are determined upon our vacation. After 69 weeks, we shall go to Disney World. Don't you know that my children would be marking the calendar down and they would easily understand after 69 weeks to mean that we are going to Disney World sometime in that 70th week. And as soon as that 70th week rolled around, my kids would be screaming, we're going to Disney World because the phrase after 69 weeks, obviously means the 70th week. If I said to you, 70 weeks are determined, or 70 seconds are determined for you to hold your breath underwater. After 69 seconds, you can come up for air. Everybody at the sound of my, breath, sound of my voice would be counting while holding their breath underwater. And for those that can't hold their breath that long, you know good and well that when you count it 67, 68, 69, you're coming up out of the water gasping for breath saying 70 because after 69 obviously means 70. So you see, we must observe that from the beginning of the prophecy, 70 weeks, there's been a consecutive run with no gaps between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks and we understand that after 62 weeks, after this total period of 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. 
And this places the Messiah being cut off in Daniel's 70th week. It is only when we try to insert the idea into the text like a gap theory that we make this prophecy complicated. When we're talking about a prophecy of a period of time, there are no such things as an undetermined gap of time. There would be no way of knowing whether or not the prophecy was a true prophecy of God or not. For example, if I was to prophesy, thus says the Lord, 70 weeks are determined upon an individual to become a millionaire. And after 69 weeks, this individual shall inherit one million dollars. Don't you know that in 70 weeks or 490 days, if that individual did not inherit a million dollars, you know what they would say? They would say that Brother Weatherly is a false prophet. But then I would say, hold on. You don't understand that between the 69th and 70th week is an undetermined gap of time. You see, after the 69th week, God's prophetic time clock stopped, and then there is this gap of time. Now, that may seem real silly, but if it seems silly in this illustration, then why isn't it silly when we're talking about Daniel 70 weeks? You see, what dispensationalism and the gap theory does is it changes a divine prophecy of 490 years to a prophecy of well over 2,000 years now. Think about this. If gap theories and prophecy were possible, then what about the test of a prophet in Deuteronomy 18.22? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. If we can place gaps in prophecies, especially prophecies in time, then it would simply render the test of a prophet superfluous. Hananiah suffered divine death because he prophesied that Babylon's yoke would be broken in two years. Apparently no one, not Jeremiah, not the Lord, understood any possibility of a gap in Hananiah's prophecy of two years. So nothing in the text of Daniel 9 implies a gap theory. It's like my friend Brother McCall points out on his thesis on Philippians 2.6 that the only way Trinitarians get pre-existence into the text is because they approach the text with a preconceived view of pre-existence. Well, the same is true in Daniel chapter 9. The only way you can work a gap between the 69th and the 70th week is because you approach the text with this preconceived view. The typical passage dispensationalists appeal to to prove a gap theory in prophecy is Luke 4, 17 through 20, where Jesus read from Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, opening prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then Jesus closed the book without reading and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So they say that there must be a gap between the acceptable day of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. But this idea of a gap in Isaiah 61 is based upon exegetical fallacies. First of all, it depends upon an argument from silence. That is what Jesus did not read. Read any book on exegetical fallacies or regarding debate, and you'll see a section that outlines the fallacy of arguing from silence. Secondly, we do not know what the Jewish tradition for reading a passage in the synagogue was. We don't know if there was a particular guideline for how many lines of the scripture they read, especially since there were no chapter and verse divisions in the Hebrew text. 
This line of thinking also disregards the other examples of Jesus partially quoting the Old Testament. For example, Matthew 21, 13, Jesus said, My house shall be called the house of prayer, where Jesus only partially quoted Isaiah 56 and 7. So does that indicate a gap in Isaiah 56 and 7? Well, I don't know anyone that argues that it does. What about Mark 15, 34? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which is but a partial quote of Psalm 21 and 1. Does that indicate a gap in this scripture? Obviously not. Likewise, this ideology disregards Jesus' statement in Luke 21, 22 of the days of vengeance coming upon Jerusalem in the form of the Roman armies, which this phrase, days of vengeance, closely resembles the Septuagint of Isaiah 61 and 2. And on top of all this, the Latin Vulgate actually contains the phrase days of vengeance in Luke 4.19, where Jesus read from Isaiah 61. So it's possible that Jerome had a copy of a variant Greek text that did contain the phrase. But the main point is that none of this proves gap theories and prophecy, especially with dealing with prophecies that specify a particular timetable. Neither should we regard the fact that the prophecy speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus's army as proof of any sort of gaps in the prophecy, because neither the grammar nor the context of the passage demands the destruction of Jerusalem and sanctuary be fulfilled in the 70 weeks. The conjunction and represents a vav consecutive, which according to Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew Lexicon, when a vav consecutive follows an expression of time, it indicates an action that takes place next or afterwards, which allows the context of this destruction to take place outside of the scope of the 70 weeks. Now, in my presentation, when I brought up the vav consecutive, I was told that the vav consecutive did not apply to Daniel 9.26 because there are vavs all throughout Daniel's prophecy. But I responded to that by saying that I got this argumentation from Dr. Paul Ferguson, who was a Hebrew scholar, and he made the exact same argument on the Vav consecutive from Joel's prophecy to show that the sun turning black and the moon turning to blood did not take place in the last days, but should be understood as next or afterwards, and that there are several Vavs in Joel's prophecy as well. So in my point of view, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. But the argumentation that Daniel's 70 weeks or that the destruction of Jerusalem does not have to take place within Daniel's 70 weeks does not stand or fall on the Vav consecutive because various commentaries agree that Daniel's or the destruction of Jerusalem does not have to take place within the confines of the 70 weeks. It's a statement about something that's going to happen outside of Daniel's 70 weeks. For example, Paul Butler says, while we believe the statements quoted above from verse 26 and 27 do predict this Roman desolation of Jerusalem, we do not believe that it is necessary to find the termination of the 70th weeks in this destruction. Oswald Alice said, with regard to the claim that the prophecy extends to the date of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, it is to be noted that while the language of verse 26 may seem to favor this, it does not require it. None of the predictions of desolation and vengeance contained in these verses can be regarded as so definitely included in the program outlined in verse 24 that we can assert with confidence that they must be regarded as fulfilled within the compass of the 70 weeks. There are consequences of the cutting off. They may be regarded as involved in it, but their accomplishments may be extended. And this, if this interpretation is correct, clearly does extend beyond the strict limits of the 70 weeks. John Mayer said, 
This is a prophecy of the judgment to come upon the Jews after their cutting off of the Messiah by Vespian, the Roman emperor, and it is not to be counted within the compass of the time of the 70th weeks. Joseph Tanner said the angel in the remaining portion of the verses makes a brief digression from the narrative of what was to take place within the 70 weeks in order to show what would be the fearful judgment that would fall on the Jewish nation for their awful crime in the rejection and murder of their Messiah and Prince just mentioned. So we have no reason whatsoever to import some sort of gap between the 69th and the 70th week. The natural meaning of the phrase after 69 weeks indicates that Messiah would be cut off sometime in the 70th week. So we understand after 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off means that Jesus was crucified sometime in the 70th week. Daniel 9.27 says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's the 70th week. And in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end of the sacrifice and offering. I think that it's very interesting that in the New King James Version, it capitalizes the pronoun he in he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, indicating that he is the Messiah. Now, the middle of the week is three and a half years, and the 69th week brought us to AD 26, which is the time period of Christ's baptism at 30 years old and the beginning of his ministry. Now, how long did Jesus minister on the earth before he was crucified? Three and a half years. That is half of the prophetic week, which means that when after 69 weeks, Messiah was cut off, he was cut off in the middle of the final week, which caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Paul wrote in Colossians 2.14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross. It was Jesus Christ cutting off on Calvary in the middle of the prophetic week that caused the sacrifices and the offerings to cease. But I know what some of you are thinking while watching this video. You're thinking, Brother Weatherly, the he that confirms the covenant with many for one week isn't Jesus Christ, it's Antichrist. Well, that's interesting because Antichrist isn't mentioned anywhere in the entire prophecy. The only ones mentioned in the prophecy are Messiah, that's singular, and the people, that's plural. Of the prince to come, is a prepositional phrase modifying the plural people, which refers to the Roman army of Titus, according to Matthew 24, 15 and Luke 21, 20. So we wouldn't expect the singular pronoun he to modify either the plural, pro, pro, uh, the plural noun people or the object of the preposition prince, which describes the people. Now understand this. Whereas we can read Daniel's chapter seven, eight and nine, in a matter of several hours or so, Daniel wasn't reading these events. He was experiencing these events, and he experienced these events over a time period of years. Daniel 7, 1 says in the first year of Belshazzar's reign. Then in Daniel 8 and 1, it says in the third year of Belshazzar's reign. Then in Daniel 9 and 1, it says in the first year of Darius, the Mede, son of Artaxerxes. Some years took place between each of these chapters, which involved the Medo-Persians defeating the Babylonians. In fact, Moser, Moses Stewart suggests that Daniel 9 took place some 15 years after Daniel 8, which we know occurred at least two years after Daniel 7. So in Daniel 9, when Gabriel says, he shall confirm the covenant, it's not only unlikely, it's highly un improbable, if not impractical, to think that Daniel would have understood the pronoun he to modify some antecedent character 
in a vision he had seen some possible three to 15 years earlier in chapter seven. It just doesn't make sense. So the only natural antecedent that Daniel would have understood as Gabriel is speaking to him, the natural antecedent to the singular third person pronoun he is the Messiah. It is the Messiah who confirms the covenant and it is the Messiah who in the middle of the week brings an end to the sacrifice and offering through his cutting off on Calvary. Now, some may object to this because the covenant Christ confirmed is an everlasting covenant, not a covenant that only lasts seven years. The Septuagint version of Daniel 9.27, which is what Jesus quoted in Matthew 24.15, might explain this better. The Septuagint states, and one week shall establish the covenant with many. In fact, several Old Testament commentators translate the Hebrew text the exact same way. So also does the Wycliffe Bible, which was the first English translation. That is, one week is not the duration of the covenant. Rather, the one week is the time period of the confirming. Jesus confirmed the covenant through his death on the cross, according to Galatians 3.13-15. through 15. The Septuagint goes on to say, In the midst of the week, my sacrifice and drink offering shall be taken away. These are legitimate sacrifices that belong to the Lord, not some counterfeit sacrifices that may be reinstituted sometime in the future. My sacrifice and drink offering shall be taken away. It was Jesus Christ's crucifixion that truly took away those sacrifices and drink offerings. Once again, Paul wrote in Colossians 2.14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The Hebrew writer proclaimed in Hebrews 10.5-10, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offering for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus Christ's sacrifice on Calvary in the middle of the prophetic week established the new covenant and took away the sacrifice and the drink offering. And so I've shown chronologically, without any sort of gaps, that Daniel's 70 weeks has been fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because Daniel's 70 weeks is not an eschatological prophecy of the second coming of Christ, rather it is a messianic prophecy of the first coming of Christ. So someone might ask, but Brother Weatherly, when did Daniel's 70 weeks end? And that's a very good question. And all you have to do is start at 457 BC and count 490 years, and you will reach the termination of Daniel's 70 weeks in AD 34, with the Jews' formal rejection of the gospel as evidenced by the Sanhedrin approving the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 8. And then we have the calling of Saul to be an apostle to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 9 so that all of Daniel's 70 weeks were fulfilled upon thy city and thy people, that is Jerusalem and the Jews. Just to fully confirm to you that Daniel's 70 weeks is a messianic prophecy that was fulfilled in Calvary, 
I've shown you the chronology without any gaps, was fulfilled in Calvary. Now let me show you that the purpose was also fulfilled in Calvary. According to Daniel 9, 24, the 70 weeks were determined to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, anoint the most holy. Notice, to finish the transgression, what did Jesus cry out upon the cross? He cried out, it is finished. Isaiah 53 and 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9.15, he is the mediator of the New Testament for the redemption of the transgression. Christ's sacrifice on Calvary finished. To make an end of sins. John 1 29, John the Baptist pointed to Christ and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. But someone says, Yeah, but Brother Weatherly, Daniel 9 24 says, Sins, not sin. Well, 1 John 3 and 5 says that Jesus was manifest to take away our sins. So whether it's sin or sins, Jesus, the Lamb of God, takes it away because Calvary made an end of sins. His shed blood on Calvary is what grants us the remission of sins through repentance and water baptism in Jesus' name. The songwriter said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus made an end of sins on Calvary. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Paul said in Colossians 1.20, we have peace through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things to himself. The Hebrew writer declared in Hebrews 2.17 that Jesus Christ is made a merciful and faithful high priest to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. Sins is just another word for iniquity. And reconciliation is just another way of saying propitiation, which is how the New King James translates Hebrew 2.17. The verb make reconciliation in Greek is used by Paul and John in a noun form which indicates in Romans 3.25, 1 John 2 and 2, and 1 John 4 and 10, that Jesus Christ is our propitiation or our reconciliation for sin through his blood. The blood shed on Calvary makes reconciliation for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness, Paul said in Romans 5.21, that sin reigns unto death, but grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans 10 and 4, Paul said Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Paul declares all throughout the epistle to the Romans that we were once dead because of sin, but now the Spirit is life because of righteousness. We have everlasting righteousness or righteousness unto eternal life because Christ worked on Calvary. Calvary is what ended the law and brought in everlasting. To seal up the vision and prophecy. The idea of a seal comes from the ancient custom of attaching a seal to a document to show that it was genuine. A seal was put at the end of a writing to show that it was complete, fulfilled, or authentic. Prophecy is open as long as it is unfulfilled. When it is fulfilled, it is completed or sealed. Christ sealed Old Testament vision and prophecy by fulfilling 
what was written of him. John 1, 45, Philip said, we found him whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophets. Jesus said in Luke 24, 44 through 46, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Therefore the vision and prophecy were confirmed or fulfilled or sealed with Christ on Calvary. To anoint the most holy, Jesus even read the passage in Isaiah 61 in Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Peter said in Acts 10.38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. In Daniel 9.24, there is no definite article hey before most holy. So this isn't talking about the most holy place in the temple. Rather, most holy refers to a person or an individual, just like it occurs without the article in 1 Chronicles 23:13, referring to Aaron and his sons. So to anoint the most holy isn't talking about anointing a place. It's talking about anointing a person, specifically Jesus Christ which is exactly how the early church writers understood it. And a legion of commentators have all understood the prophecy of 70 weeks. So when we examine the timetable of Daniel 70 weeks and the purpose of Daniel 70 weeks, we find that this prophecy is a prophecy that has been fulfilled and has nothing to do with end time prophecy of the great tribulation or the second coming of Jesus Christ. Daniel 70 weeks is a beautiful messianic prophecy of Jesus that was fulfilled in Calvary. I hope that this lesson has been a blessing to you in your study of Daniel 70 weeks. God bless.